Welcome back to the VTUE Shikshina program. Today here we are here to talk about 18 ERC 43 building services 1, what is supply and sanitation. So today we are basically looking at storm water management in this particular class and uh, how exactly it is accessed and uh, the hierarchy runoff as well as the harvesting methods in terms of recharge of the, our groundwater. Storm water management. Now, until the previous class, we were basically looking at sewage and its management as well as assessment. Today, in this particular class, we are beginning to see as to how exactly we are going to walk with respect to the, you know, infill which comes directly from our rainwater. Storm water is nothing but rainwater, and as everybody knows, it's precious to us, and we have to see as to how exactly we are going to deal with it both in terms of uh, it falling upon our groundwater sources as well as onto our surface water sources. So, stormwater runoff, if you actually see its whole cycle, basically is the runoff which comes from the roof surfaces, from where the drain inlets would take it down to the storm or we would also have gutter downspores from where it would again be connected to the street runoffs. Right, And then from there, the yards also would add up to the storm water, then the street washes in case anything else falls upon the roads. So, all the storm drain systems fall there and then they are all connected to one outlet called the storm drain system outlet, okay, which is basically going to end in the local creeks storms, lakes, rivers or in the ocean. So, that is the outfall point for all the rainwater or the storm water which is collected at various sources all along its line of movement. Storm water if you actually see and understand is any kind of precipitation which could be rainfall and that could fall upon any surface of the ground. It basically does not soak into the ground because of the surface runoff while it flows into the storm sewers or surface waterways or even into the receiving streams. The term storm water is also used to apply to water that originates for, from overwatering of landscapes and which enters into our storm water system. Although a natural part of water cycle, storm water runoff is also an environmental concern. Why is it called as a concern for us in terms of environment? Because if you see, there are two different types of uh, drains uh, with respect to the storm drains. One is the untreated runoff, which is basically all the rainwater which falls onto various surfaces and which might just flow down to the storms and might end up at the final output. But there is also treated wastewater which flows the storm water which would have collected itself all along its origination from the downpours to the road washes to the you know animal waste and all are carried all along this and then they fall upon the treatment plant and from there it is treated and then let out into our sewer system. So, this is how exactly the whole cycle of it is uh, seen off. In general, if you actually see, there are two fates of any kind of storm water. In a natural landscape where there is no development, basically like a forest or something, storm water is absorbed into the ground or falls into bodies of water. This gives needed water to the plants and animals and also replenishes all the reserves of surfaces as well as groundwater. But also in an urban landscape, we see the storm water which falls upon impervious surfaces. Now, what are impervious surfaces? Impervious surfaces are basically surfaces which do not absorb any water. They could be roads, they could be sidewalks, rooftops or even parking lots which are not going to soak up any of the water into their ground. So, as a result, all the falling water is basically swept across the surfaces as runoff. So, that is runoff. So, here we are learning two basic uh, new terms. One is impervious surfaces. 
impervious surface is a surface which do not absorb any water because they are hard core surfaces all right and then whatever is swept across these surfaces is termed as a runoff so if you actually look at the whole natural water cycle when it falls upon a forest or in an open space or open park or space or whatever we basically see that the water falls directly onto the ground it actually gets absorbed into the ground or maybe if there is a water body or something it gets you know involved into the water and also replenishes the whole surface as well as ground water. But if you look at the whole cycle again at the urban water cycle, we see because of all these things there is less infiltration and there is a very low ground water flow also because of the hard bedrocks that we would have put up because of the construction of you know, buildings and uh, you know the surfaces. And then since this is done, there would be a lot of runoff. Now, this runoff should actually have some kind of an outlet, but if we are not providing any kind of outlet, the only thing that a little part of this cycle would get back into the, uh, uh, you know, the whole cycle is basically because of evaporation, otherwise it is all going as wastage. But if you actually try to see the whole urban cycle through a sustainable eye, we see if there is a lot of condensation which happens and contaminated runoff which flows into our you know uh, wetland spaces. If we actually provide some kind of a soil right below our surfaces or constructed areas, we would have a much better infiltration. So, this whole uh, infiltration method actually uh, enters into our ground and our wetland is also treated. And then from there uh, uh, you know the natural system gets back its water there might be stream and then it could also evaporate so this is a way of looking at how exactly we uh, see this fate of storm water storm water runoff plays a very important role for us in terms of pollution because as the runoff flows across the ground it picks up all the pollutants and picks up all of uh, that is laying up on the road, carries them into the local waterways such as rivers, lakes and streams before making its way into the ocean. So, in a natural system what we have to see is a variety of plants can be put up because they act as filters that could clean up the pollution from the water as the water percolates into the ground. These natural filters like the plants pollutants and the other debris actually accumulate and are washed away into the bodies of water. In addition to transporting pollutants, runoff can also cause erosion as well as sedimentation by sweeping away as well as displacing the soil. It also causes localized flooding when storm drains take on too much water at once. So, if you actually notice that is the storm water, there is addition of pollutants there all these pollutants are carried back into our river systems and if we are not looked into by providing some kind of filters then our water body or drains might get uh, flooded and this might cause some kind of a uh, erosion as well as sedimentation which might affect back onto our urban spaces only. So, these pollutants enter the surface waters like our lakes creeks, streams and also other natural waters when they are picked up by the storm water. And daily activities which are happening around the water body also deposit a lot of pollutants okay? and they create the polluted runoff when irrigation or precipitation events introduce the contaminants into the receiving waters. <coughs> So, historically if you see all the municipalities dealt with storm water runoff by draining it away from the buildings and roads as quickly as possible through underground pipes or discharging directly into the nearest stream or river. Some storm water runoff is still dealt with in this manner which is called as the uncontrolled storm water runoff. This uncontrolled storm water runoff leads to many problems. The problems could include flooding, erosion of stream banks, sediment buildup in the culverts, 
degradation of aquatic habitats because as the end product they are basically ending up at the oceans. So, they, we are degrading the aquatic habitats and also pollution of freshwater resources. So, basically if you see what are the different ways that actually are lying across our own living spaces. One could be the pest waste, fertilizers which we, we might be putting across to our plants and gardens and lawns, motor oils, the gutter runoff, the street runoff and any kind of litter. So, all these litters are like all these things combined together are the pollutants which might be carried back into our waterways and might cause a lot of uh, you know difficulty in terms of controlling the pollutants. So, we have to be very sure in case of seeing or noticing all of these uh, a kind of a drain, a kind of a picker is basically put up. So, all these things get drained right there uh, before they enter into the storm water system. Yet, if you actually see all around us, we seem to design systems which are basically to flush down the drain, albeit a little cleaner. If and how the increasing housing density is generating more storm water than any olden suburbs. So, these olden suburbs would be creating lesser uh, runoffs because of the more amount of ground availability as well as this would have lesser ground availability and the density of houses or the built up structures are more. So, the storm water which is uh, you know the rain water which is basically falling upon all these surfaces comes down as storm water runoffs. So, how can we actually perceive and see that the storm water can help us? in what all terms can it actually help. If you know and understand the storm water and its cycle, we basically see that uh, it is closely connected to precipitation. So, what is precipitation now? When you see rain or even snow fall from above, you are basically watching precipitation. So, when does precipitation come from and how does it fall in different forms? So, precipitation basically happens when the water falls down to the earth's surface, this water might be in a liquid or solid state. If it is in the liquid state, it is called as rain. If it is in the solid state, it is called as hail. So, it is also part of the water cycle. This water cycle is what actually moves the earth's water around the planet to places where plants, animals and humans can use it. Precipitation is one of the four important parts precipitation is one of the four main parts of the water cycle. Basically, if you notice in a water cycle, we have condensation, transpiration, evaporation and precipitation. So, precipitation is the first part from where the water gets evaporated, the liquid turns into gas or there is transportation where basically the water from plants turn to gas. There is condensation where all the cooler gas actually turns the liquid back to ice and this ice becomes the droplets which condenses itself and along with the particles of air to form a cloud. These clouds bring back the precipitation and make the whole cycle complete. And uh, if you notice the precipitation prospects, we see it does take many shapes. Rain and snow are probably the most well known types of precipitation, but there are also others. The temperature of the cloud and the air between these clouds could actually differentiate the kinds of precipitation. So, these graphics that, I that I am going to show you in a couple of uh, in three different slides is basically talking about how exactly the sky would also look. Notice the graphics here. Okay. So, this is rain. Rain, we all know, we all have seen it, heard it. It is a liquid water droplet which falls when the temperature in the air or at the surface are above the freezing point. This starts as water droplets or ice crystals in a cloud, but always falls as liquid water. The next form of precipitation is hail. The balls of ice that fall from clouds and can even put the dents in cars are known as hails. 
hails are created in thunderstorm clouds. The water droplets forms in the cloud and gets pushed upward where temperatures are colder. The droplets freeze and form the hailstone. These hailstones grow as more and more droplets of water freeze onto them and eventually they fall down to the ground. We also have sleet. The icy precipitation is known as sleet which forms a thin layer of warmer air which comes in between layers of cold air. A top layer of below freezing air creates ice crystals that might melt as they fall through a thin layer of above freezing air. If there is enough room between the warmer air and the ground the water droplets refreeze in a bottom layer of below freezing air and fall asleep. So, when they are like semi liquid form there is liquidity there and the bottom layer would have frozen. So, that is when it is called as sleet. Freezing rain basically falls like rain, but as soon as it touches the ground it freezes and starts as acting as ice crystals. The ice crystals melt and turn into water droplets as they go through a layer of above freezing air. If the temperature in a thin layer of air at the surface is below freezing, then the water droplets freeze when they land. Gropel. Gropel is also another term for precipitation where gropel is the frosty kind of snow. This forms in below freezing temperature when the snow crystals in the cloud collide with very cold water droplets. The water droplets freeze loosely onto the soil giving gropel a slushy texture a slushy texture. Snowfall. When all the air between the cloud and the earth surface is below freezing point, you can look at snowflakes closely, you see their unique and beautiful shapes. So, these are the different types of precipitation that actually reaches as storm water and the processes involved in the formation of rain is basically as I mentioned earlier called as the water cycle or also the hydrologic circle cycle where we first have the rain water which falls down as precipitation right when the clouds turn dark matlab they become heavier so it becomes precipitation and then they fall upon the ground then we have surface runoff so if there is a lot of ground available then it becomes underground runoff where the water gets absorbed into the soil. Otherwise, flows down onto any open space or water body, accumulates as a water body, evaporates, later turns itself into condensation and then forms clouds and then repeats the cycle. Otherwise, we also have transpiration which basically happens at the opposite side of the cloud uh, raining. So, this transpiration also changes back into condensation and then completes the cycle. So, if you look at the part of the water cycle, the water cycle is what is actually making the earth's water cycle move, right. So, we also have something called as evaporation here. So, evaporation means water from plants which turns into gases, transpiration which means basically all the um, water from the plants turning to gas, evaporation is the liquid turning to gas, condensation is the gas basically cooling and turning to liquid water to ice. The droplets condense on particles in the air and they create a cloud by themselves. Precipitation is any water which falls on a liquid or solid state. So, these are some terms that you have to remember as we proceed with the classes. So, a hydrologic cycle if you know and understand there are various ways as we previously mentioned that is the water vapor which is seen in terms of precipitation in the atmosphere is called as water vapor. The water which reaches the earth surface through precipitation could be rain, snow, hail and fog and the water that enters the earth subsurface is through infiltration. So, basically that is the cycle, this is a, an image which is given by the 
uh, hydrological conservation commissioner who basically talks about how precipitation on the land happens through evaporation and evapotranspiration and then we also have a lot of moisture over the land which basically turns into perspiration precipitation and then evaporates it back into the ocean. So, that is how the whole water gets back to us as recharge and it lets out all the runoff. Now, if you actually go back to all the collected water, we have runoffs from yards, we have runoffs from roofs and we also have runoffs from driveways and streets. Now, all these runoffs are basically collecting water, right. So, but with this, we also know that there is rain water which is falling upon the ground. So, this rain water is actually uh, collected and uh, measured by an instrument called as rain gauge, which is a standard instrument for measurement of rainfall. Okay, this is a circular funnel with a diameter of at least 203 mm which collects all the rain into a graduated and calibrated cylinder. The measuring cylinder basically records at least up to 25 mm of precipitation. So, this is a manual uh, rain gauge which basically collects all the water and then you have to manually read the whole uh, readings or otherwise we also have the automatic rain gauge which basically gives you the readings after collecting the uh, rain water. And how do we actually lay it? Like if you see a whole open surface, there is a height of a nearest uh, you know uh, obstruction like a tree or a building or something. So, uh, away from it, two times the height of that particular obstruction should be the distance of the first rain gauge that you are going to place. This rain gauge is going to collect all the rain water and then give us the recordings at least of 8 inches of rain gauge can be given as the recording for us at our country. So, how exactly does the rain gauge work? Rain gauge basically has a measuring tube which is almost like one tenth area of the funnel and there is also a measuring scale that is 10 inches if you notice this is 10 inches. We also have a collecting funnel. So, this collecting funnel basically collects at least one inch of rain as it uh, rains and then it gives us the measurement about as to how much of water has been collected for 1 inch of rain. That is how it is placed at the ground. How do we assess storm water? Now, assessment of storm water is basically when you are trying to read and analyze what exactly are the methods in which we can quantify storm water. So, quantification of storm water is calculated through two methods. One is the rational method, two is the empirical formula method. In both the methods, the quantity of storm water is basically the function of the area that is in terms of hectares and the intensity of the rainfall and the coefficient of rainfall. So, all of these together are going to give us a coefficient of runoff at the maximum rate of runoff which mainly depends upon the slope of the surface and also the estimated condition upon the drainage area with the proportion of the rainfall that is going to run through the surface. In the rational method, the storm water uh, is quantified by the rational formula where Q is equal to C dot I dot A divided by 360. So, what is Q? Q is quantity of storm water in meter cube per second and C is coefficient of runoff, I is the intensity of rainfall in mm per hour and A is the drainage area in hectares. So, in the above formula it is very clear that the application of rational method we need to actually see coefficient of runoff that is the C. All right, and also the rainfall intensity which is I are equally important along with the correct judgment in terms of how much of it is falling upon how much of an area. So, this area is to be correctly judged. So, how do we judge that? The area can be accurately determined by the following three steps. In the first step, the whole plan of the city is prepared and a tentative arrangement of all the sewer lines are shown on it. 
in the whole area is then divided into zones and then the concentration points along the proposed sewer lines are marked. In the second step, the selection of the rainfall frequency and the rainfall intensity for this frequency is determined. The time of concentration of storm water basically includes inlet time as well as the time of travel. So, the time of travel plus the inlet time is where we are basically getting the rainfall frequency as well as the rainfall intensity. The inlet time is the time required for the rain in falling on the most remote point of the tributary area to the flow across the ground surface along the drains or gutters. The time of travel is the time required by the storm water in travelling from the uppermost inlet up to the point of concentration. In the third step, the proportion of rainfall which enters into the sewer is actually directly determined as runoff. So, first we understand the plan of the city, we first try to draw the plan and try to see as to where exactly they are zoned, the sewers are zoned and then we mark all the concentrated points of sewer lines. In the second step, we are basically selecting the frequency of the rainfall and the rainfall intensity is also determined based on the time that the water takes in terms of its inlet time as well as the time travel. Once this is done, the proportion of the rainfall which enters the sewer directly as runoff is also determined. So, these are the three steps upon which we understand the area which is actually taken for the calculation of this particular method of rational method of uh, assessment. Now, what is runoff coefficient? Um, runoff coefficient in a rational method is basically the value of runoff is uh, required. The whole quantity of the rainwater that basically falls upon the ground which would not reach the sewer lines or drains is called as runoff. A portion of it percolates into the ground and a portion evaporates, a portion is stored in ponds and ditches and only the remaining portion of the rainwater reaches the drains and sewers. The runoff coefficient is a fraction which is multiplied with the quantity of the total rainfall to determine the quantity of rainwater which might reach the sewers. After continuous rainfall for some time, the ponds and ditches are filled up and the atmosphere becomes nearly saturated. Therefore, the runoff coefficient mainly depends on the characteristics of ground surface as porosity, wetness, ground cover, etc. And we also get some kind of values which are commonly used in determining the quantity of storm water which could reach the sewer line. What this particular learning means is the whole rainwater which falls as the overall quantity does not reach the sewer line, right. So, only a portion of it percolates into the ground, a portion of it evaporates, a portion of it is stored in ponds and ditches and only a very little part of the remaining part enters into our drains and sewers. Now, this is to be multiplied with the overall quantity of total rainfall to actually determine how much is reaching our sewers. Once we calculate this for continuous rainfall, the runoff coefficient depends on what are the kinds of the uh, soil conditions. So, the soil conditions or the ground surface values are based on porosity, wetness and ground cover. Now, this particular table is talking about the various uh, coefficients of runoff in terms of various surfaces. If we have wooden spaces or wooden uh, characteristics like forests and all, then the runoff is 0.01 to 0 0.20 because everything is actually absorbed by the ground. For open grounds 0.10 to 0.30, parks, lawns, meadows and gardens would have almost the same. Gravel roads and walkways would have 0.15 to 0.30. Road, roadways would have around uh, 0.15 to 0.6, the stone pavements with any kind of open joints could have 0.40 to 0.50, good quality pavements would have 0.75 to 8 point, 0.85, 
Asphalt pavements in very good condition would have 0.85 to 0.90 and watertight roof structures would have 0.7 to 0.95. So, as every locality consists of different types of surface areas, it is very difficult for us to calculate the overall runoff coefficient. So, a formula is used to understand coefficient. So, what is the formula? The formula is runoff coefficient which is C, capital C in an overall area 1 coefficient, area 2 coefficient, area so and so coefficient likewise we keep calculating the areas and then a area 1 plus area 2 plus area 3 and likewise area n which gives the sum of a and c that is area n coefficient and then the sum of the areas where areas are the different types of areas and C1, C2, C3 are their runoffs. When we try to calculate this, we actually get some kind of values for our coefficiency of different localities. So, the approximate average which would happen is based on the population that is uh, you know existing on that particular surface. Now, for each of the coefficients, there are different types of populations also. So, there could be populations which are thinly populated might have at least 0.35 of runoff coefficient, suburban areas where houses are all detached to each other, where lawns are you know prevalent would have 0.45 to 0.55, areas with semi detached houses would have around 0.65 because the density of population there is at least 60 to 80 people. A thickly populated areas would have 0.75 and highly congested areas like business spaces and all because they are all laid out as concrete more than 100 people would be there at a particular coefficient runoff. Now, with this it is very clear that calculating runoff coefficient and area of each type of surface is to be measured and then substituted in the formula. These calculations are impracticable as well as tedious. Therefore, runoff coefficients are chosen by inspection of the localities which directly depends on the density of the population. So, an overall coefficient for different types of calculatives are done as seen in the table. The next type of assessment is the empirical formula method. Empirical formula method basically determines runoff at very large areas. Generally, empirical formulas are used under certain specific conditions where we have to actually understand the slope of the land, the imperviousness, the rate of rainfall, etcetera. These have been developed suiting to a particular region after long practical experiences as well as collection of field data. Before we used to actually see this particular method working on the FPS system which is a foot pound second system and now almost all the values are converted into the MKS which is a meter kilogram second system. And there are various formulas which we basically see in different countries. The Bucchi Zagla formula which is basically used in the European countries is basically talking about the coefficient, runoff coefficient, the intensity of the rainfall and area by <coughs> square root of S by A, where S is the slope of the area and A is the drainage areas in terms of hectares. Right? Then uh, in the U USA or the Americas, we basically see the MacMaths formula, where we are almost following the same uh, formula, but here the only the numbers change, it is uh, 4158 and 14835. The fuller's formula basically is seen in the other places where we are only calculating the C which is the coefficient and the drainage area in square kilometers divide, uh, to the power of 0.8 divided by 13.23. The fanning's formula basically only talks about the drainage area in square meters and Talbot's formula also calculates the drainage only in terms of square meters. This taking forward the uh, above example, if we actually try to see as to how exactly people calculate the uh, you know quantity of sanitary sewage for various populations, I have just given you an example of one uh, 
particular problem and how it is solved. For example, they say if a density of a population is at least 300 people per hectare and the rate of water supply is 250 liters per capita per day. The question might come as calculate the quantity of sanitary sewage for separate system and for partially separate system. Now, the solution is for quantity of sanitary sewage for separate system, we have to understand the separate system basically would have reduction in storm water, right. So, the quantity of water supplied would be 200, okay, into 300 into 250 liters per day. So, 200 into 300 into 250 divided by 24 hours into 3600 gives you at least like 173.5 liters per second. So, for peak discharge, we at least would consider this to be twice of its size, so which would be 347 liters per second would be the answer for separate system. But if it is combined, if it is combined, you have to know that quantity of a separate system plus storm water drain which comes from your roofs and pavements is also calculated. So, first we calculate the storm water, then we calculate how much it is for partially separate and then we try to multiply them both together and then we get the solution for it. So, if you are trying to look at infiltration methods, we see at an open space most of the storm water enters into the ground. So, we would have shallow infiltration for 25 percent, deep infiltration for 25 percent, 10 percent goes off as runoff into the hard surfaces and 40 percent actually evaporates and transpirates. So, we would have 40 percent of evapotranspiration, but if we have an impervious cover at an urban level, there is 10 percent shallow infiltration very less 5 percent deep infiltration, 55 percent is actually involved as the runoff and 30 percent of the runoff actually goes out as evaporation or evapotranspiration. So, 75 percent to 100 percent is of the water is basically getting wasted because of the impervious cover. So, this is something of a major concern for us when we are trying to understand the storm water concern because why do we need to think about it? Because if you actually look at the soil levels and soil layers, this is a scale upon which uh, we have just given the gradients upon which the ground water table is. First layer would have the gravel, then second would have sand, silt and clay. So, these are this is a relative scale uh, size for us to actually understand the particles. Uh, the first layer would basically infiltrate at least 5.7 inches per hour, second would have 5.7 to 1.4. 1.4 to 0.14 and less than 0.14. So, because the gravels are larger, there would be a lot of uh, you know in and out spaces. So, the water would infiltrate. From there, the sand would filter it, it would enter into the silt and then the clay which is invisible at this scale. So, basically uh, at the class A soils, we would have excessively drained or well drained um, uh, soils according to the rule of thumb which would be at least 5 to 8 inches per hour. Class B soils would have at least 1 to 2 inches per hour, which would be moderately or well drained, not so well drained uh, uh, soil. Class C soil would have sandy loamy soil, which would have slow infiltrations and the class D soil would have no filtration at all. So, this is the rate of thumb wherein we basically are trying to understand the various layers of infiltration in terms of different soil rates. So, why do we say it is different? Because of the relative soil particle sizes. Now, for example, if we have gravel, okay, this the, the first layer, the water actually enters, but because this is concretized, it would move away as runoff. But because the next layer would have all these layers, the water would start infiltrating and it would at least go deeper to 5 to 8 inches at least if the soil conditions are good. And if there are no good conditions, then only the infil no infiltration happens. 
So, what are we actually waiting for? If you see, we have to wait for a water to stay with us in the ground level for the longest haul. So, how do we do that? We can actually have for irrigation purposes, we can actually try to have something called as the wet sump rain gardens. Now, these rain gardens are collecting all the water, you know, and then they are also keeping them in store as reservoirs and trying to see as to how exactly they can be aligned in terms of availability and non availability of water. The longer the water gets detained in terms of all these spaces, the more greener and functional would become the area of this particular space. Other than that, we also have uh, domestic rainwater tanks which are basically collecting all the water. Now, how does water get collected in rainwaters? I am going to go in deep about rainwater harvesting later, but I am just going to give you a glimpse of how exactly uh, rainwater harvesting happens. Now, all, all the rainwater which collects upon the sloped surface is collected in a tank. This is called as a rainwater tank. From where? from where we basically irrigate our garden or we might even have some kind of shade of our trees. Then we also have household reuse or portable water reduction spaces. Then we have geometric limitations on amount of the roof that can be harvested based on sizes of uh, domestic tanks that we are putting up and if there is lack of understanding on operation. So, these are the rainwater tanks and feasibility in terms of collecting the storm drain um, runoff. Other than that, in the urban levels, at the urban public spaces, we see we can also have something called as passive street tree irrigation. So, we can have, we can line up all the trees and try to capture the storm water there. So, how does uh, uh, rain water get uh, captured there? First, we collect it at the uh, streets, then there are seepers here, the watering might enter through the side entry pits, right. And then we also have these tree pits which with, uh, pave, uh, with uh, uh, permeable paving. We also have a geotextile layer right below that. So, this layer is actually going to have some kind of green structure for the whole soil system, right. This is going to keep all the water with it, absorbing all the water and keeping it with the itself. Next, we also have some kind of a strata vault uh, soil system and after which as I mentioned earlier, the sandy so uh, soil loam. This is basically going to have a lot of porosity because of the high air which is filled in it. And then we are also having a subsoil drainage after which it enters into the street drains. So, if this is done, we can at least have a lot of infiltration into our ground as well as to water our um, landscapes. So, otherwise we would be losing on a lot of uh, street catchment. So, this is one way in which we can actually irrigate our street channels if we have a lot of impervious uh, layers of uh, you know graying. So, how does it look? It basically looks like that at the outside where we are not even understanding as to how exactly the uh, inner layers of the grounds are working in terms of storm drain off. So, we would have the tree irrigated there. So, the trees are watered at every point. So, we would also have these point watering side entries for each of the tree and we would let in all the storm there and it would get collected and during um, uh, regular storm water, uh, during regular flow it would be collected and when it is not uh, raining or something, this entry pit at every 10 trees is required. So, we can use the same water which is stored during the dry weathers and maybe use it for watering our trees and plants. So, if you look at any kind of development that happens, if there is a pre-development area of the same space. So, all the surface runoff which basically falls upon the ground enters into the ground and gets infiltrated, gets filtered into the ground. But because of development, 
the more the concrete spaces, the more the gray and the black spaces that we see, the more the conveniences decrease. As the conveniences decrease, we also see that uh, water is supposed to be collected and taken off from all the um, concrete spaces because of the development that is happening. So, how, how do we do that? We first basically need to understand estimating of the rain off quantity. So, how does runoff basically work? As I mentioned earlier, the runoff is basically the flow of water which falls upon any surface which is not going to absorb any um, rain water. So, runoff is the rainfall minus the interception minus the infiltration minus its depression storage. So, any kind of depression storages, dip, these are depressions. Or simplified version may we can also call it as runoff is rainfall minus infiltration. So, this is anything which is not infiltrated is called as a runoff. So, the rate at which the volume of a runoff is collected over a period of time, it totally depends on the roughness of the ground surface, on the slope, on the distance of the travel and at what rate does flooding happen and erosion happen. And this is usually measured as cubic feet per second. So, when the runoff is not collected and uh, you know conveyed well, then we have something called as floods. You all know what are floods. So, I am going to only talk about the control methods in which we can actually control floods as an architect or anyone related to designing of town. How do we control a flood which basically is the rain water which has reached its extreme in terms of storage. So, one thing is we could regulate it, second is we could store all the runoff in a separate space, third we could also canalize it through canals, dikes or even dams or upgrade our severage system which is something very difficult for us to do at a later stage of development or divert all the structures. So, these structures would be regulating and these are various ways in which we can actually control the whole flooding. So, now why does flooding happen? Flooding might happen due to various reasons which could be naturally um, you know connected. One could be torrential rains and because of these torrential rains entering into our urban areas, the urbanization and the increased uh, you know um, paved spaces would increase the surface runoff. So, this might cause discomfort for many people or collapse of dams, tsunamis which would could be caused by underwater earthquakes, melting of snows, monsoon rains, global warming or even deforestation. So, there are various ways in which flooding happens and these are all uh, ways or methods upon which we can prevent floods. We as humans cannot stop floods, we cannot stop the rains from falling or stopping to flow from one surface to another or from bursting its banks. So, these are all natural events, we all know about it, but we can do something to prevent them from having any kind of an impact upon our urban spaces. One is create some kind of sea or coastal defense walls. So, these sea or defense walls prevent all the tidal waves which push the waters up ashore. In some areas, sandbags are also made and placed in strategic areas to retain the flood waters. So, this retention is only done for high tide space, uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, floods. It is not for low tide because low tide is usually below the defense wall. Only during the high tides it might reach the self de uh, uh, sea defense wall and only a portion of the water might transform itself into the cities. How do we control flooding? To control flooding the first thing that we have to know and understand is control water level dams. How do we do that? by pumping stations. We can pump out all the water and then let out all the water. So, the water does not retain there for a longer period of time or even build barriers like embankments or even flood walls. We can alter the reverse channel by straightening it or widening and deepening it. 
we can control the land use around a river through land use zoning. So, this is how we can dam it up through a pumping station, a pumping station would pump out all the water which is not required. Building a barrier wall against the water body so that the town stays safer. If there is a river channel, if in case the river is causing a lot of problems for our irrigation fields and all, we can alter the channel of the river by maybe working upon a, on its progress. Have a controlled land use with respect to development of uh, towns or cities around water bodies. So, we should always keep in mind that the uh, water bodies should not be flowing right against the walls of the structures because that is going to cause a lot of harm to us in the longer run. Always make sure there is a distance between the water bodies and the uh, you know development that is going to happen as and we progress with the development. Always keep in mind about the various ecosystem habitats that are actually falling upon this category. So, we give enough space for the open spaces and also give enough space for the urban spaces to develop against the road. And also keep in mind about new developments because if in case we are very close to any water body, there should be flood proof materials or minimum floor heights making the buildings more resilient to floods is our major concern. Like the previous 2018-19 we saw the Kerala floods where almost the whole uh, state was flooding away. So, the first thing that the government thought of is thinking about its zoning setbacks. So, how much of setbacks should be kept because if we do not maintain the pro uh, proper setbacks from the hazardous areas then it is very difficult for us to control it during an emergency. And if in case of a larger space or a larger built up structure, we have to fill the land of the low lying areas, lift the buildings above the sea level, so the floods do not affect the buildings. If it is a new developed area, if it is an already existing structure uh, against uh, or closer to a you know flooding region, maybe you can construct levees to protect the houses in the flood prone area. So, the water does not enter into our residences or even keep uh, you know compulsory purchases of all the flood prone houses away from habitation. And if there are any existing buildings, raise them on stilts so that they are flood resistance and they could reduce flood damage. So, how do we maintain the levees? So, if there are buildings which are already existent, levees are to like almost like setbacks. So, they could be put up there because before implementation we are basically trying to see if this is the water body and its highest level gradient. The levee also should be almost of that height only and after implementation you see that the water would actually decrease in terms of by because we have raised the bank. And the target of the highest water level would basically be lower than the levee that is being put up. Or another concern for us is the highest water level while dredging a water channel. So, dredging is when we are actually digging the water a little more beyond its own course and also widening it. So, when we are widening the river channel, basically all the water that is uh, you know within the space starts accumulating in the space that is newly created and might we also create some kind of walls all around uh, you know flood prone regions. So, this kind of a river channelizing also happens and this gives a clear idea for the river to move or the water body to move in this direction only and it does not let the water enter into the uh, you know spaces where people are habited. Or we can also think about how the zo uh, zones can actually work in terms of flood plains. Now, imagine this to be a water body that is a river, there is a lot of irrigation that is happening, the pastures and the residences which begin with. So, you have to be very concerned about this to be grazing land only and we could have crops and grazing area all along 
The settlements should begin only after a minimum distance that is calculated based on the intensity of the uh, you know flood plain and then zone it out this way. So, the next road basically falls only there. So, when this is there, this is at least create some kind of safety concerns for us when we are actually trying to implement new development in a new town or a city. <coughs> the other methods of containing flooding rivers as I mentioned earlier is the walling, the flood wall. That is like a barrier which is built along the river banks. This is made out of concrete, stone or brick. So, the river bank if this is a water body and this particular uh, wall would stop the water from entering into the settlement. Creating of levees, these levees are wide embankments which are built along the river banks. They could be made out of clay, sand or even soil, sometimes topped with sandbags. So, if this is a low level area, this could be the high um, uh, like an embankment, basically an earthen embankment. So, the water actually does not gush out into the nearby settlement. So, in these are the various methods in which we can actually control all the flooding that is happening and maybe have precautionary measures put forward before we actually suffer. Thank you so much.